this week uh, I went down to the New Life Church. They had a pastor's gathering there. It was a council round table. And I hadn't been to one before. It was their fourth one. I hadn't had a chance to go before, but this time I thought I'd go. I said, Was, do you want to join me? So he came down and joined us. And we were just talking about some of the things that are coming up and what, as a council, what does the council want from the churches to see an impact in the community and to see things happening. And it's actually an amazing testimony that uh, Griffith Uni is actually doing a study and starting a study to look at the impact of churches on the social environment. And it's the first time in a positive spin that they're gonna be looking. There's more things coming up with that that hopefully I'll be able to share in the new year that's been happening. It was a great time down there and it was nice, lovely to meet other pastors. And I have to say, in all my time being involved in churches, I don't think I've seen a unity of pastors praying for the Gold Coast like we have today. I don't think I've seen a unity of denominations praying for each other like we do today. Uh, there's a prayer meeting I go to once a month of the Northern Gold Coast pastors, and we have anywhere from a pastor church in Yatla, um, here in, in Coomera. We have one at, at um, Hope, Hope, Hope Island and different places, um, and even some, there's Bible League that turns up, there's the Gideons that turns up, and they all share the Salvation Army group turns up, and everyone is sharing about what God is doing in their lives and we're praying for each other. We're praying for the community. We're praying for other churches. And I've never seen a time where we're seeing the presence of God. And from the beginning of the year to now and the end of the year, I've just sensed something incredible of God is about to do something. God is about to do something and His Spirit is looking for those that would work together as one in body. And so at New Life Church, as we were there, I got to hear their amazing pastor speak. And um, uh, Michael was sharing a word and he brought up Romans chapter 12, verses 1 to 2. And if we can open up our Bibles. I've got quite a few scriptures. This scripture is not on there, Beck, but I've got quite a few scriptures that I want to bring up on uh, the screen. If you can read it and it'll be online as well. And Romans chapter 12, chapter 12, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, I love the old King James, King James, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. He's saying that when we present this body, this shell, I present myself and it is my reasonable service. And then verse two, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that what is good, that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And that word conform just shone out at me. Like most of you, I've read this scripture and seen this scripture so many times, but that word conform, conform, conform. That word that is what is on the outside that looks the same as everything else. That is what what it looks in appearance to take on that outward form that would be the same as everything else. And what he's writing here is do not be conformed to this world. Don't be and put on an outward appearance that is the same as this world. And then he gives us a key on how to make that different. And he said, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That there's something about a transformation in our body and soul that brings something out and manifests out. And I wanted to look at that this morning. That he wasn't writing in here, be not conformed to what you see, the ideology and the political and everything like that. It's not talking about that. It's talking about the heart because in God, everything that is on the inside will come to the outside. There is nothing hidden from God. And when pressure comes on our life, when we have the Spirit of God in our life, what is in the inside will come out. And without the Spirit of God in our life, 
What is on the inside can be fear, anxiety. It can be uh, our own selfishness. And what is on the inside can flow out without the Holy Spirit moving in our lives. Hallelujah. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 17. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. He who is joined to the Lord is one, a oneness, ichad, that oneness to God, that this was the design of God, that we would be one with God, and we know from the garden that they traded oneness for likeness. They traded oneness for likeness. What does it look like when we pray in the Spirit? What is tongues for? What is the impact of speaking in tongues? What is the impact of the Holy Spirit in our lives? And what is the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives when we're praying in the Spirit? And I want us to look through this, and there's quite a few scriptures, but I want us to look at the Word, that the Word of God would shape something as we see it. Remember, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That we're allowing the Word of God to come in and shift things. John 3, 6, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. And in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 23, we see the distinction of body, soul, and spirit. It says, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of the Lord. May your spirit, May your soul and may your body be preserved blameless at the coming of the Lord. So in that day of the Lord, at that time that the Lord is appointed, um, that we go through, there should be a camera there that we're able to put that up on, keep it on live stream 4K and hit pro presenter there without it, so we can see the picture and the, and the part up there. Um, with that part of there, there's three parts. And every part, it says, will be presented before the Lord. Every part. We have, a, we are spirit, which has a soul and lives in a body. You are not your body. We're going to get a new one. Praise the Lord. I'm looking forward to that, whatever that's going to be like. We will get a new body and a new name. But we get a new body and we are not our body, but neither are we our soul. We are spirit and we are the spirit that God has placed within us. Our body, our identity, I should say, is not in our body. Although sometimes when we look at the things of the world, it would say that your identity is in what you look like and what image you can get. It's quite incredible how much things change once things hit social media, how much it changes. Oh, you can't be like that now. You can't say this that now. You can't behave like that now. And it shapes how it is, but the only way I want to be shaped in my life is according to the Word of God. His is the only approval that I need is the Word of God. And this body, my identity is not in this body. And I can tell you, praise the Lord for that. This identity is not in how I look. It's not in the shape of my body, which tends to change the older I get in so many ways. Neither it is, is it in my soul. And so our physical body, we know, is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And through the body, we have the five senses. We have sight, hearing, taste, smell, touch. The physical body is where the decisions of the heart are manifested. We have our soul, the realm of our soul. And the realm of our soul is the place where the mind, the will, the emotions, the personality come to the fore. The mind, what we think. The will, what we desire. The emotions, what we feel. And the personality, how we behave. All those contribute, all those things that the soul operates in manifests and finds its way through this physical body. Combined with touching, combined with sight, combined with smell, combined with taste, we have the two working together, but that doesn't define who I am. So often as Christians, we can be defined by our soul because we're defined then by how we feel instead of what the Word of God is saying. 
The Bible tells us, Matthew 10, 28, do not fear those who can kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Man cannot kill your soul. They can kill our body, but they cannot kill my soul. Rather, it says, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. That's actually a very sobering statement, even as Christians. Rather fear him, revere him who can destroy both your body and your soul. Everything I think, my wills, my desires, my emotions, my personality, that there is a God that can destroy that. Our spirit lives forever. Ezekiel tells us that all the souls belong to the Lord. And Matthew 16 tells us, For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? I find it's like a tree. That the top of a tree is the produce. It's the body. We then have a root system of the tree and so often the root system that stays close to the ground and just spreads out is, is where that place we nurture the most and it's our soul. But it's the root that digs deep. It's the one that goes right down, as, that connects into our spirit as the one that we need to nurture. And everything as any tree, whatever is happening below the ground is shown above the ground. If the ground is no good, if the root system is no good, you will have a bad tree. If it doesn't work, the tree, it will manifest through its growth. It will manifest in its wilting. It will manifest on the body. And that's how it is. In Genesis, oh, sorry, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. I want to just show a distinction. And I'm sure you know all these scriptures, but if you like, I can, I can put the notes on the app so people can access them. And um, so it saves you writing things down, but you can do both. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the vision, to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. The Word of God is there and it will pierce in, discerning my thoughts, discerning my, not only my thoughts, my intentions. Could you imagine being judged on your intentions? Could you imagine if your husband or your wife or your children or your parents judged you on your intentions? We would be in big trouble. I didn't do it yet. Yes, but you were going to. I haven't done that action. Yes, but you thought it. You entertained it. There was that fleeting moment. And we are judged according to even our intentions. Even our intentions. And so Hebrews shows us that there is a division between soul and spirit. That there is a breakdown in there. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. Let's go back to the beginning. It says, And the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Or King James says, a living soul. God formed man in the ground. He placed man in the ground, and then he breathed, and that word breathed is neshamor. It's not the word ruach. Ruach is used in other passages where it talks about the breath and, and Ruach is the life that is in everything. But we are blessed because we have been breathed by God, His divine breath. Everything that God is, everything God is, He put man and He formed man together and He moulded him. He said, let's put a bit more there. Let's shape it here. Let's move that there. No, I don't like that part. Let's put this together. And He's got this outer shell. And then God says, I'm going to take what I have and I'm going to put it into man. And He breathes His breath, the same as His name, Yahavaha. And He breathes who He is into man, Neshamah. And we become alive. And the moment the Spirit of God enters into us and life is there, it comes through and it brings our soul into life. How we feel, how we think, our emotions. And man became a living soul. Proverbs 20, 27 says, The Spirit of man is the lamp of Jehovah. The spirit of man is the lamp of Jehovah. Our spirit was created by God so that we can connect with God, that we can receive from God. 
Our body and soul have specific functions, but it's only our spirit. God is spirit and we worship him in spirit and in truth. That it's our spirit that connects to God, not my soul that connects. My soul manifests what my spirit is doing and it finds its way out from my spirit to my soul to my body that would make me jump, shout, dance, praise. Well, dancing, not so much. I'm not that good at it. But certainly jumping and shouting and and behaving undignified before the Lord because I worship Him and praise His name and it flows from my spirit. When you look at the prayer of Mary and she said, my soul magnifies the Lord. Great song there. My soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit exalts that connection in spirit. How does it look in our prayer time? John 7, 37, Jesus says, Who who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. New King James says heart. King James says the belly. Uh, New American Standard says innermost being. Out of the innermost being will flow rivers of living water. The God that put his breath into me out of my innermost being, out of my spirit would flow rivers of living water. And so we know that at the Garden of Eden, man was, man was created, Adam and Eve were put there. And so God's spirit was within them. Their spirit was alive. When sin entered into their hearts, there was a breakdown and death had come into their spirit. But because of Jesus Christ, death in a sense of cutting away, not that the spirit will die because our spirits will live forever. Just depends where we live, but our spirits will live forever. And so through the salvation, through the cross, that we're able to come back in and have that connection back to God. I had so many notes, but I just wanted to sort of go through and just get to the point. One of the things, have you ever been on a phone call and you've got a bad connection? Now, if you're like me, you're probably not because you guys are all good. You, probably, you guys are all, all saints. But if you're like me, and you have a bad connection, there's something I tend to do. I tend to start shouting. And I tend to start going, you there? No? See, you got me? Are you, can you hear me? Are we connected? No, I said we're going this way. And I get louder and louder and louder. But the problem isn't the volume. The problem is the connection. And that's how it is in our spirit. We're shouting from our soul, from our feelings, and we're carrying on and shouting and and bursting and shouting. But the problem isn't the volume. The problem is the connection. The connection that your spirit has with God. The connection back to God. When we pray, and the Bible tells us to be persistent in prayer, but there has not been one bit of shouting that God says, Harry, I was going to answer you, but you just didn't shout enough. You weren't loud enough. Sorry, I couldn't quite hear you. I couldn't quite hear you. There's not one bit of shouting that God got God to answer a prayer. That the Bible tells us that we come to Him and we pray and we need to be persistent in prayer. But being persistent in prayer isn't it about coming in that I can force God to do something and force God to go against His purpose and go against what He has designed. Persistent prayer places me in His will. And that's why we need to be persistent in prayer. Persistent prayer, when we're praying from the Holy Spirit, shapes us. And we're going to see what that looks like. We know that God is all-knowing. We know that God is everywhere and He knows every part of our lives. And this God that knows everything and every part, when we pray to God, when we pray from the body, when we pray from the flesh, and let's be honest, we've probably all had those prayers That we're praying from our flesh, we're praying from our cravings. We're praying from what we desire, from materialism, from our ego. We're praying to God from that. When we pray from our soul, we're praying from our emotions. We're praying from how we feel that leads us to actually ourselves and not to God. It's only when we pray from the Spirit that we're truly praying. And I think sometimes we miss how we pray because we get caught up, because everything works together, spirit, soul, body, 
We find ourselves praying and it's not that God is not interested in how you feel. If he wasn't interested in how you feel, he never would have given us a soul. He is interested in how we feel. But he wants us to come to him in spirit and in truth. So often we try and make up in emotion what we lack in spirit. And then we find ourselves becoming tired. You been there? I have. Countless tribes, drives, countless times praying, God, God, when are you going to send us some musos? God, when are you going to help us with people? God, when are you going to, God, you just need to do this. God, if you just don't supply something, oh, I don't know what we're going to do. I don't even know if we can keep going anymore. How are we going to be able to do it? I'm just getting exhausted, God. Surely you know how I feel. Surely you know how hard this is. And how am I going to keep going? And then I feel the Spirit go, really? Really? You're going to go there? Really? Sorry, Lord. Lord, you know everything. And I surrender to you. You know my needs. And your word declares that you shall supply our needs according to your riches and glory. So I say that back to you, Lord. This is what you have said. Lord, I, I speak to you and declare the words that you have spoken up, spoken over our church in the prophetic. And I speak them back to you and I tell God the things that have been spoken. I tell God what he has told me and remind him and say, Lord, I wait in contentment. Yes, frustration. But I wait in contentment and say, Lord, let your will be done. And we change how we pray and we change. You know, prayer is conversation. Atheists pray. They have their conversation. Buddhists pray. Muslims pray. Mormons pray. Agnostics pray. We think of prayer as just us to God, but everyone's pray. Everyone has a conversations. People might go outside and have a conversation to a tree. People might go outside and have a conversation to their motorbike. Are you okay, baby? Everything all right? <laughs> <laughs> I know, you're a little bit dirty. We'll, we'll clean you up later. <laughs> We've, everyone prays, but it's only when we are born again that something shifts and change because we're praying from a place inside our spirit. I pray in the Holy Spirit, not because I'm trying to connect with God. It's praying from a connection with God. It's like I don't worship to connect with God. I worship from a connection with God. And the countless times that I have been out praying and I've stopped in my prayer and I just start, Lord, 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 you're wonderful. Lord, you are beautiful. And everything you are, Lord, I praise you. Lord, I worship you. You are mighty and wonderful and glorious. My soul cannot express enough in words how amazing you are. And it shifts everything because I've changed from where I've positioned myself and how I'm praying. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 10 to 12. For to us, I don't know if the whole thing's up there or not. Okay, this might be the first part back of... Um, the next slide. It should be the scripture and some words. Yes. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 10 to 12. This scripture tells me the Holy Spirit searches the depths of God and the things freely given by God. 1 Corinthians 6, 17, which we said before. This tells me I am one with the Spirit. Romans 8, 26. This tells me that the Holy Spirit prays over me with groanings when I don't know what to pray. 1 Corinthians 14, 2. This tells me when I speak in an unknown tongue, nobody understands me except God. 1 Corinthians 14, 2. The same verse, it also tells me that when I'm praying in tongues, I'm praying in the Spirit. No one knows God like himself. No one knows God like his spirit. No one knows me like God's spirit because his spirit was put in me. 
The Holy Spirit prays. The Holy Spirit prays knowing every hidden thing in this heart of mine. And the Word of God says that the Holy Spirit prays over me with groanings. So if the Holy Spirit prays over me with groanings, what better person to pray over me than the one who knows me better than I knows myself? What better one to pray over me than the one who knows God, who knows everything of God and knows everything of me and can put us together so that as he prays in groanings that I do not understand, he leans my spirit towards what he's praying when I'm praying in tongues. He leans me towards his prayers. He leans me towards, and this is what I found I've often do. I'm praying in tongues. Father, I just want to pray for your hand on seal. I just pray for your miraculous healing touch upon her, that everything, Lord, I stand against this, these allergies. I stand and break it in Jesus' name. And I start to speak in tongues, and I, I just sense that the Holy Spirit is speaking a prayer beyond what I know, but is leaning me towards what to pray. And so I find myself speaking in tongues, praying in English, speaking in tongues, praying in English, speaking in tongues, working together so that my spirit would move towards. The Holy Spirit prays the will of God. His prayers, as I said, bends us towards, leans us towards the will of God. Our, his prayers move our hearts, our emotions, our soul towards the will of God. And we must persist in that. So that in persistent prayer, things change. The Holy Spirit wants to speak over you more than any human prophet can. I love the prophetic. I love the words and I love, I love having the prophetic words spoken over my life. I like it. It's encouraging. It really is. Because it gives me something and go, Lord, thank you. You're hearing me. You know what I'm, you know the, how I'm feeling. And, and I just thank you for this prophetic word. Yet the Holy Spirit is better than that. The Holy Spirit prays more than that. Because God is speaking through a prophet, releasing in part, known in part. Yet when the Holy Spirit prays, it's not in part. It's in fullness. If the Holy Spirit prays for me and my spirit agrees with what the Holy Spirit prays, we pray the same thing. And when we pray in the Spirit, we are praying what the Holy Spirit is praying. 1 Corinthians 14, 2. If anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to people but to God, indeed no one understands them. They utter mysteries by the Spirit. This tells me that when I'm praying in tongues, I'm praying in the Spirit. When we pray in the Spirit... We pray without our own intentions. When we pray in the Spirit, we pray without our own motives. When we pray in the Spirit, we pray without our own desires. When we pray in the Spirit, we pray without our own selfishness. When we pray in the Spirit, we pray not from our soul, of course, but from the Spirit. When the Holy Spirit comes and He gives us the gift of tongues that the Bible says, and the Bible shows us that there are three different tongues, and some say four, but I, I, I think there's three because you can split one into a couple of things. We have what is called the proof tongue or the tongues of men. And this Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 13, the Spirit of God fell and they were speaking in tongues and everyone who was around them heard them speak in their own language. That would be amazing. Amazing. And they all heard him speak. You know, I remember Pastor Lenny Weston. Does anyone remember Pastor Lenny Weston? Pastor Lenny Weston used to say that he had often the Holy Spirit would move through his life and he'd start speaking in tongues and he has, it would come out. He says he spoke in Chinese, even though he doesn't know a word of Chinese. I think he said he spoke in, Af in an African language. I know there's different parts of French and other things. And he spoke in there and he has found himself speaking in tongues and someone from the other side, Somewhere in the room, they said, come up to him and said, Pastor, you prayed this and this and this. And he had no idea. That would be amazing. The proof tongue benefits the unbeliever. Because they're all gathered around. And they saw the people from the upper room speaking in tongues. And they said, what is going on here? I can hear you and understand. You guys must be drunk. And we know Peter's passage that he went on. 
1 Corinthians 14, 22 was another scripture for there. The proof tongue requires no interpreter for the interpretation to be understood by the unbeliever. So you can speak in tongues. Someone else will go, yeah, I know what that is. And they're hearing it in their own language. If you're going to have to do that, then you have to speak in Dutch because that's the only other language I understand. There's also the prophetic tongue. This is where a word is given in tongues and an interpretation of that tongue is given. We see this that Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 12.10, 1 Corinthians 12.30 and 1 Corinthians 14.13. And this prophetic tongue is what I think a lot of us would grow up in church where there would be someone that would stand up in the stillness of worship And some would start to speak in tongues and then you'd have to wait. And you'd wait for someone to give the interpretation of that tongue. And I guess the person who gave the speaking in tongues is probably thinking, I got the easy part. It's waiting for the person to say something. And usually when no one else did, the pastor would often speak what he would feel. I grew up with that a lot in church where you would hear tongues and interpretation of tongues. Actually, we were actually caught up with Peter and Kath um, last night, not last night, Friday night. And uh, they were saying they had that happen in their church. Tongues and then interpretation of tongues. I thought, how amazing is that? And so there's the prophetic tongue. The prophetic tongue requires an interpreter to benefit the church. The prophetic tongue is understood by the church, of course, because of an interpreter. Then you've got the personal tongue, the one that most of us would know and probably operate in the most. And in the personal tongue, 1 Corinthians 4, 14, I should say, 1 to 4, and um, verse 4, Verse 4 in chapter 14, he who speaks a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. And when we speak in a personal tongue, that's we start to move and pray in tongues. And and the tongues can change and shift how you're praying and what God might be doing. And it's taking that step of faith because speaking in tongues takes a step of faith. Pastor Patrick was sharing to me the other week how his nephew, his nephew got a healing of God, incredible miracle. Um, And his nephew prayed and said to God, God, if this tongues thing is from you, I want it. Something like that he prayed. And he said instantly he started speaking in tongues and he couldn't stop himself for two days. For two days. Just flowing, speaking in tongues, speaking in tongues. I remember my old pastor, Pastor Ted Williamson. Beck, I don't know if you remember him. Pastor Ted and Nola Williamson. And I remember Pastor Ted saying in a message when he was talking about the Holy Spirit, he worked as, as a manager in a silverware, selling silverware and stuff. And he was the manager of that business. And as he was at work, he got filled. He had an encounter with God. He got saved. And he got filled with the Holy Spirit. And he started speaking in tongues. If you thought two days was bad, he was speaking in tongues for one week. One week, he says, it got that bad. Someone would go, Ted, is there, what, what are you going to do here? What do you want to do with the personnel? He said, it got that bad. He hid under his desk. He hid under his desk and he stayed there and he realised, I think I better just go home. Because the Holy Spirit just hid him so much, he was speaking in tongues. Acts 2, 1 to 4 tells us they were all a place. I want to look at some, just some scriptures quickly of um, how the Holy Spirit and how the move of the Holy Spirit works. It is different ways. Acts 2, 1 to 4, the day of Pentecost has fully come. And it says they were all with one accord in one place. That they're in one accord, one purpose. And I know God's going to do something on the Gold Coast because I haven't seen pastors working together like this in a long time. One accord. Our purpose is, this is what we pray most of the time, Lord, save our city. Save our city. We need to see changes. We celebrate other pastors when they say, I've got this uh, pastor we know, Gary and Amanda. They've gone from Southport and they're moving to Broadbeach because God opened up a building for them. 
and say, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. And we're praying with them that they said our small church in this massive building, that it'll fill up. Praise the Lord. We celebrate. They're in one accord. And in verse 4 says, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Acts 4 Chapter 4, 24 and verse 31, Peter and John, when intimacy and faith come in, that they'd heard, so when they had heard that, they raised their voice to God in one accord. So they were not only in one accord, in this next part, they were in one accord and they raised their voice because they were talking about what had happened and what God had done. And verse 31 says, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God with boldness. So the Holy Spirit came upon them and enabled them to do what they didn't think they could do. If you find anything hard, If you find that I'm not someone who can knock on a door, I'm not someone who can stand up the front, I'm not someone who can do something, yes, maybe not in you, but in the Holy Spirit you can. The Holy Spirit can empower you, Acts chapter 8. In verses 14 to 17, we have Peter and John again, and it says in verse 17, "Then, then they laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. How do you receive the Spirit? Well, you've got to be in one accord. In one accord, and they lifted up their voices. And it says, by laying on of hands. And they laid hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 10, 43 to 46. It says, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word. Who just heard the word. That is something. They were there, hearing the preaching, and the Holy Spirit fell. And came upon them because they heard the word of God and they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Because the Holy Spirit moved. Acts chapter 19 again gives us another example. See, when we pray in tongues and we go to pray in tongues out loud in a prayer meeting, we battle our flesh. Was would you mind coming up, Kate? We battle our flesh. And we say things like, I'm going to look really silly if I just start praying in tongues. Well, perhaps you will. But not to God. When we pray in tongues and we're praying out loud, we can feel unusual. When we pray in tongues, we go, oh, this is just uncomfortable. And yes, you probably will feel that. But not to God. When we pray in tongues... And we start to step out. We can feel vulnerable. What will people think? What will they say? Are they, you know, we even think, are they going to think I'm just making this up? How would they know? They don't even understand what you're saying. Yet we think that because our flesh is so vulnerable. And we think, how am I going to do that? How will I, will I feel vulnerable? Yes, yes, perhaps you will. But not to God. Because we're praying from our spirit. We need to have more of that. Empowerment by the spirit of God. Enabling grace from the spirit of God moving in our lives. Could we sing, I've got it there, you are holy. The baptism in the Holy Spirit isn't just something you receive it's something that also has to be released I found so so often as Christians we get filled up and we can go to hear speakers and we can go to conferences we can get prophetic words and it's great and it fills us up and we feel encouraged and filled and filled and filled but if we don't release it the word says that we become like a cistern rotting water Because we're meant to release what God has. That would benefit, as the Word says, each other, ourselves, the body, unbelievers. That we're meant to release what God has. And release what He's placing in our lives. See, moving in the Spirit is only foreign because we don't practice it. And I'm not talking about practice like 
Well, it's, it is. It's, you practice the guitar. You practice singing. You practice a job. You, pra- you, you work at something until it becomes a second nature. And when I pray in the Spirit, when I pray in tongues, when I move in the gifts that he does, it's a gift that he's placed. It doesn't define me because it's just the gifts. But by operating and allowing his spirit to move in here, it establishes his character within me. I want more of God. I want more of God. I want more of his spirit. I want more of his presence. I want more of who he is. I want to see the Holy Spirit move that before anything happens, we would see manifest signs and wonders, not because of the signs and wonders, but because God is here. Because God is here. I want the Holy Spirit to show me and filter, as I shared last week, to flee from sin, to purify my heart, to come before him and let him take it all. Let him take it all. Can we stand up this morning, bow our heads? Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for your presence. We thank you, Holy Spirit. Lord Jesus, we worship you. We exalt you in this place. I pray this morning, Lord, that even for those watching online, if they need a refreshing touch of you, Holy Spirit, that our hearts would cry out aloud, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my unrighteousness. Purify this vessel. Help me to be more than I am. Holy Spirit, come into my life. I receive you, Holy Spirit. I just stand on the word and the promise that says you are faithful and I receive your Holy Spirit into my lives and I just take and and just receive the gift of you, Holy Spirit, and the gift of tongues and I just release that in my life in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. For those watching online, if this is you, we want to encourage you to just reach out to us. We'd love to pray with you.